Welcome to the Highlands. We're so glad that you're here. And uh, last week, if you're wondering, like, what in the world is going on? We passed some booklets out last week. We are in a new chapter of the Highlands story that God's writing. And so we talked last week about uh, moving forward and expanding what God's been doing here in the lot behind us, in this lot right here on 20th and, and Rancho Vista, building out a new worship center, more classroom spaces so we can uh, fit what God's been doing in this, in this uh, church in this season right now. And if you have any questions, we'll have a gathering after this to help you understand or if you have any questions. But take out this sheet for me for just a moment before we jump into our message. And Pastor Mandy a moment ago was talking through some things. And here is my uh, goal today. My goal is that every one of you in this room would fill this out with something to do for the Lord over the next 21 days. I believe that, I've been praying it this way, that I believe the next 21 days could be some of the greatest days of your entire life. But I believe that because I'm going to ask you, we're going to talk about today in a moment, uh, that we're going to obey what God is calling us to do. And so we're going to take some time at the end of our, our, our gathering, our moment together, uh, our, our uh, time together, and we're going to pray and ask God, God, what would you have me do right now? Because today is all about obedience. Now, we have a lot to do, so we're going to jump right in. If you have a Bible, turn over to Joshua chapter number 6. If you have our church app, you can open up the church notes. You can see the verses on the screen, but we're going to be looking at a story of Joshua chapter number 6 of a, of a guy named Joshua who took over the leadership of Moses. Now, if you've ever seen that old cartoon movie, Prince of Egypt, you know all about Moses, where he took the Israelites out of Egypt, God part of the Red Sea, and he took them in uh, and away from Egypt. Well, he died, and now the new guy is in. His name is Joshua, and now he's leading the people into their very first battle. Like, this is the moment where, like, the rubber meets the road. Joshua is going to see, do I have what it takes? And he's going to move forward. And what we find here in Joshua chapter 6 is a conversation between God and Joshua. Look at what we read in verse number 1. It says this, Now Jericho was strongly fortified because of the Israelites, no one leaving or entering. So, verse 2, the Lord says to Joshua, Look, I have handed Jericho its king and its best soldiers over to you. So here's the good news. God's like telling Joshua, Joshua, you already have the victory. Like the win is yours. Like that's already a foregone conclusion. That's what's happening. But look at what verse uh, number three shares with us because now it's the battle plan. God's like, all right, Joshua, I've already given you the victory. All you have to do is obey me in this plan. Let's check this out. Verse number three. March around the city with all the men of war, circling the city one time. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry seven ram's horn trumpets in front of the ark. But on the seventh day, march around the city seven times while the priests blow the trumpets. Verse number five. When there is a prolonged blast of the horn and you hear its sound, have all the sh- uh, troops give a mighty shout. Then a city wall will collapse and the troops will advance each man straight ahead. Now, I don't know if you caught what we just read, but here's what happened. Joshua is trying to impress the people of Israel. Moses was this iconic, legendary leader. Like, they made movies about Moses. And so now Joshua is filling his shoes, and now he's leading the people, and he's like, God, what are you going to have me to do? Like, what's the plan? Like, what's the battle plan? And God's like, all right, gather on Joshua. Here's what it is. And Joshua's like, all right, I can't wait. This is going to be amazing. Like, I can't wait to go tell the people what the plan is. And so all of a sudden now God's like, all right, I want you to get your people and I want you to walk to the city. And Joshua's like, okay, that's smart. Like, yeah, we're going we're gonna to get our most intimidating soldiers up front. We're going to show them their strength and numbers. We're going to walk up there and we're going to make them afraid. And so Joshua's like, what do we do when we get to the city? And God's like, well, I want you to walk around the walls. Okay, that makes some sense. Like, we're going to find out their weak spots and what's unguarded, and we're going to find some holes. And God, that's a great plan. Like, we're going to walk around. We're going to do a survey trip. This is going to be amazing. And God's, and so Joshua's like, well, what do we do after we walk? God's like, well, walk back to camp. Walk back to camp. Like, wait, we just got there. Like, what, what are we doing? And, and then Joshua's like, well, okay, I, I, maybe God, I got it, God. You want us and the cover of night to attack them. Like, this is amazing. All right, what a great plan. And God's like, no, I actually want you to just go to sleep. Like, go to sleep? Like, we only walked. In fact, uh, that the walls of Jericho was about a mile and a half walk. So they walked a mile and a half. 
went back to camp, went to sleep, and Joshua's like, okay, well, maybe Jericho was expecting us at night, so maybe we could surprise them in the daytime. Okay, so day two, we attack, right, God? And God's like, nope. What do we do? Walk again. Wait, you want me to tell the people of Israel that we're going to walk and just walk for six days? And God's like, it gets better. On day seven, you're not going to walk one time. You're going to walk seven times. I did the math for you. A mile and a half times seven times is ten and a half miles that they walked in one day. I don't think I could have been in God's army because I don't know if I could have walked ten and a half miles in one day. I think I've done that maybe once at Disneyland. I'm not sure, but we don't often walk that much. But, but Joshua's like, oh my goodness, like God, you're telling me that we're going to walk 13 times around the walls and they're going to come crashing down and that is what you want me to tell the people? You see, what God's sharing with Joshua and the Israelites and to us today is obeying God even when it doesn't make sense. You see, I've, last week, I felt a little like Joshua coming to you. We're a few years into the transition, and I've followed a, an incredible leader, our founding pastor, Pastor Ken, and I came to you last week, and I felt like Joshua, where I'm like, God, like, you want me to tell our church what? You want us to build right now? Doesn't God know it's like an election year, which is volatile? Doesn't he know? We, don't, I, we have uncertain economic times right now. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. God, did you forget we still have some debt on this building? Like, are you sure you want us to do this? And I've got to tell you, I felt a little bit like Joshua when I'm like, church, God's telling us to build. Now, let me address a couple of those things. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and so God could tell us to build at any point, and no election is going to determine what God has for this church. But let me tell you the second thing. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine, and let me tell you, the, 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 the interest rates, they don't matter to God. God's like, whatever. Like, that's a man-made thing anyway. I, my thoughts are higher. My ways are, are greater. And I don't think we need to walk foolishly, but I do think we need to walk obediently. Now, we have some debt, and just so you know, our staff over the last year, we've tightened the belt, we've cut some costs, and we are working on making double principal payments every year so that in just a few years, we'll pay off this building and be debt-free on this building. And so I want you to know that I'm coming to you as a Joshua saying, all right, church, we're supposed to build, but I want you to know that this isn't a foolish obedience. This is a faith obedience. And let me tell you, there's going to be things in your life that God's going to say, I want you to do this. I want you to go there. I want you to obey me here. And you're going to be like, God, that makes zero sense. God, like, you want me to go where? And then how many of you know when you follow him, all of a sudden he brings your spouse. He brings a promotion. He brings a blessing. He brings something that you didn't even know was possible. Why? Because you obeyed and took the first step of faith. Uh, let me tell you, and I shared this on Easter, but I, I want you to know this. I did not know a single person. I mean, I didn't know one person that went to the Highlands when I started coming to this church. Talk about being like a scary proposition of like, God, you want me to go to that church? It's very different than what I grew up in. I grew up in the Suits and Tie Church. I grew up in the church where we sang hymns all the time. Like a new song was a song written in like the 1800s. Like that was a new song for us. And I'm like, God, are you sure you want me here? And I cannot tell you blessing after blessing after blessing that God brought into my life because of one step of faith-filled obedience. I'm wondering what step are you called to take that you're a little bit afraid of stepping out. Today I want to talk for just a few moments about obey, obeying God when it doesn't make sense. Now, you know the story, perhaps, of Joshua chapter 6. The Israelites, they went to the walls. All of Jericho is looking at them. They're like, what is happening? On Jericho news that night, they're like, we have a stupid enemy that's just walking around our walls. Like, what is wrong with them? We'll come back live tomorrow to see what they do tomorrow. Like, six days, Jericho news is like, they're walking around again. Like, who, what fools are these? Like, what in the world is going on? 
And for seven days, they walked, and they walked, and they walked, and they didn't realize they were in God's fitness plan and not in his battle plan. And so all of a sudden now, they're getting their exercise, and God brings a victory seven days later because they were willing to obey even when it didn't make sense. You see, if you and I obey God only when it makes sense, we are walking by sight and not by faith. But God tells us that faith is what we are called to live out, walk in faith. And when we can't see it, God will bring it to light and our obedience will actually move forward in a greater way. Now, let me share with you briefly three quick areas that obedience will test you in and as we think about what God's calling us to do. The first test that we find in obedience is this. Number one, the test of priorities. The test of priorities. Now, God tells Joshua, he says, all right, Joshua, remember this. Before I tell you the plan, I've already given you the victory. Now, let me tell you, God's already given you the victory in your life. The question is, are you willing to obey the plan that he has put in front of you for your life? What we find in Matthew chapter 6 is Jesus is encouraging the disciples. He tells them in verse 33, he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and when you do, everything else will be added unto you. You see, obedience tests your priorities. Now, I see this probably uh, highlighted more often uh, than in, uh, in youth sports. Parents, we, we, we show our kids our priorities when it comes to youth sports. Now, I have to give you a disclaimer. I love sports. I always have sports on. My family gets so annoyed because I have, I'll watch any sport. Like, if it's like a historic horse race, like the Kentucky Derby, I'll put it on. Like, the Masters is on today. I'll probably have uh, the closing rounds on. Like, I love sports. And I love youth sports. I believe they teach a lot of lessons and uh, hard work and commitment, character. They're so good. But parents, I found, are often uh, quicker to obey their kid's coach than to obey God. The coach will give you one hour notice of like, we got a clinic. We got a one-on-one. We need you here. And parents, you'll move heaven and earth to get your kid to that practice. But oh man, well, it's Sunday morning. I don't know if we really want to go in. They've got youth group, but I don't know. Or we've got summer camps coming up. You'll spend thousands of dollars on your coaches, but a few hundred dollars to send your kid to camp to hear more about Jesus. Ugh, I don't know if it's in the budget. I mean, my private coach is in the budget. Jesus says, and there's a lot of parents in here, and I know you're mad at me, so I won't look at you, and we'll just kind of like be in this, <laughs> we'll be in this tension together. My girls have been involved in youth sports their whole lives. It's been gymnastics, it's been volleyball, it's been cross country, soccer. I get it. But Jesus says, what does it profit a person? They lose, if they gain the whole world, but lose their own soul. Parents, let me ask you a question. What does it profit your kid to get all league in their sport, but have no relationship with Jesus? Again, I'm not preaching or speaking against sports. I'm speaking against wrong priorities. Many times we're like cheering our kid when they score a touchdown, but we should be more excited when we see them reading their Bible. We cheer them when they get a kill in volleyball, but let me tell you, we should be more excited when they invite a friend with them to church. We get so excited when they score a goal, but how about when they have a a worship song on their mouth and they're singing or or they're humming that at home? Let me tell you, uh, parents, your responsibility is to teach them the right priorities. And many times we have it twisted. We have it wrong where we're like, if my kid can just get uh, maybe this scholarship or they can get in this place or they can get this, and what we're showing our kids is that your spiritual life is secondary to your athletic life. And we are failing our kids. Youth sports bring out the priorities in our, way, in our life like nothing else. I heard old-time preacher back in the day when we still had checkbooks. He would say, show me your checkbook and I'll show you your priorities. And I don't know what we do, do with checkbooks anymore, but the idea is that what we spend our money on is what we prioritize. Well, God, I don't really have enough to like give to you. I don't really have enough to be generous because I have all these other toys that I'm paying for. 
God, I, I really want to do more for you, but I just can't right now because, you know, I've got my, you know, my bowling on Tuesday. I've got my me time on Wednesday. I've got my favorite show on Thursday. And Friday night, you know, I didn't really like to go anywhere. And, but God, any other time, you know, let me know and I'll check my calendar. And God is testing our priorities through the obedience of us to him and his word. My question for you, not just parents, but everybody, where are your priorities at? I mean, I would obey, but I just can't right now. I would do that, but I just don't really want to, if that's what we'll admit. You see, obedience tests our priorities, but obedience also, number two, it tests our practice. It tests our practice. You see, in Joshua chapter 6, I love this. I, I'm like, God, like, did you not think that Israelites were capable of anything? Because God's like, all right, before I ask you to walk around seven times on Sunday, I'm going to need you to show me that you can do it one time on Monday. Like, God's like, um, I'm, I'm going to need you to walk around one time for six days, and let me see how you walk, and then on the seventh day, we'll, we'll see where, you're, where you are. And I feel like many times in life, we have this idea that, well, we can just skip all these other things. I don't really need to read my Bible. I don't really need to pray. I don't really need to share my faith. God will just kind of miraculously, by osmosis, just bless me, and he'll give me all of the knowledge that I need. And God's like, well, actually, I need you to practice your faith every single day. There's a great verse in Philippians chapter 4 that Paul says, he says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. You see, often we have this mentality that I don't need to do anything other than just occasionally show up on a Sunday and God better bless me in a big way. And we are expecting God to do things that we were not practicing for. Now, I know this is going to surprise you, but I don't go to the gym, okay? Like, I know, like, you're just shocked and amazed. And I know this will surprise you, but if I went into the gym tomorrow after having not gone in, I don't know, I didn't know last time I went to the gym, like, it's embarrassing, like, years— I don't think I would be able to walk into the gym. Well, actually, I could, but I don't, I don't want to brag right now. But I could walk into the gym tomorrow and just bench press 400 pounds right off the bat. Like, just bench press 400 pounds. Don't worry, I couldn't. I hurt myself. Like, you'd be like, where's Pastor Jeremy? Oh, he tried to bench 400 pounds. Now he's in the hospital for six weeks. Like, he just, that's crazy. But here, here's why I know that I can't bench 400 pounds. Because I haven't been practicing it. Do you know what you have to do before you bench 400? You have to be able to bench the bar. And I'm not sure if I could do that either. <laughs> but here's the point. Not my physical fitness. My point is you. My point is, we, we think we want all these big things that God has, and we want him to do all these things, but we're not really faithful in even the little things. Jesus reminds us, he says, those who will be faithful in little, I will give them much. I can nearly guarantee you, Every single time, 100 times out of a 100, when God blesses somebody publicly, it's because there was a whole line of private obedience. You see what happens is when someone gets a new car, it's not because that they are smarter than you or that they are better with money. It's because God's blessed them because they were along the way. They were okay with their 1995 Saturn. And that's a true testimony right there out of 95 Saturn. I have to tell you about some time. It's, it didn't make left-hand turns. It was a crazy car. But let me tell you something. If we're not grateful for the 95 Saturn, why would God bless us with anything better? You want a promotion. You want more income. But what are you doing with the income that you have now? If you can't handle $1,000, why would God give you $10,000? Because if he gave that to you, you would actually just be 10 times more apt to mess that up than you would with $1,000. So God's like, all right, if they're going to mess it up, let me just give them $1,000 to mess up instead of $10,000 to mess up. And I could nearly guarantee you that anytime someone has been blessed by God, it's because you could find some steps that were not on social media, that you didn't see, that no one knew that they were following Jesus every small step of the way, and they're being very faithful in the little that God had so that God would bless them with more. So I'm here to tell you, if you want to be blessed by God, it's not through osmosis. It's not because you go to the highlands. It's not because you know so-and-so. It's not because you're God's favorite son or daughter. It's because you have had a trail of obedience and saying, God, in the practice moments, 
in the moments that nobody saw, in the moments that I didn't post on Instagram, in the moments that I was by myself, I was still walking with you. I was still following you. I was faithful in the little, and now God's blessing you with more. You see, obedience tests us in the practice. It it tests us in the moments that nobody can see. It tests us right now because we're saying, God, we want more, and so we're going to be faithful in what we have right now. There's a phrase that we heard, practice makes perfect. And the idea is that when you practice these things, you're going to get better at them. And so many times parents will say, well, I don't really know questions about the Bible. I don't really know how to answer my kids' questions. And it's like, that's okay. Why don't you start reading a little bit every day so you can get better? Well, I don't really know how to pray for an hour. That's okay. You don't need to start praying for an hour tomorrow. How about you pray for 60 seconds tomorrow? Let's start there. Let's practice with that. Well, I don't really know that I can really trust God with my finances and really like full blast and full bore, like honor him. Well, why don't you start with something? Why don't you start with a small step and say, God, I'm going to trust you in my obedience because God test us in the practice. He tests our priorities. He tests our practice. And then there's one last thing I want to share with you as we wrap up our time together, and that's this. He tests us in our praise. What I love about the story of uh, the, the walls of Jericho is that God tells the people of Israel to praise before the victory. This is kind of unusual because all of a sudden, uh, the Israelites, they've walked around now at this point 13 times, and the next instruction was to look at the walls and shout. Like, lift a praise. And in that praise, obedience would flow and the walls would come down. You see, it's easy to praise after the victory. It's easy to praise after the promotion, but what about when you feel like you're stuck in your job? It's easy to praise on your wedding day, but what about praising God before when you feel all alone and no one is ever going to love you? It's easy to praise when God brings you a, a new thing, but it's hard to praise before that thing arrives. I'm telling you, we praise before the victory because that's what God's calling us to do as we obey Him. Now, when I was uh, in elementary, I shared with you how shy I was growing up, and I actually probably don't know this about me. I played Tiny Tim in a Christmas Carol production at my school. Now, the reason I played Tiny Tim was because I was like the smallest kid in elementary school. And I, I was like, when the play director came and like, you would be perfect. I'm like, no, I can't do that. I'm too shy. And she convinced me with two things. She said, one, you only have one line with four words. God bless us, everyone. I'm like, all right, I think I can remember four words. And she said, in one of the scenes, you play dead. I'm like, I could, I could do that. I could go on stage and play dead, like lay down and be still. And so she hooked me with that. And I played Tiny Tim in Christmas Carol. And I remember as we started the practices, kids would goof off. There was not really anybody being serious. You kind of just, if you've ever been in a play or production, you know, like in the early times, you're just messing around. But as the performance dates get closer, you begin to get more serious. In fact, uh, they have what's called a dress rehearsal where maybe the week or two before you would start putting on your like outfits or costumes. or I I was in one play. I don't know all the lingo of all the performance stuff. So you put on your costumes and all of a sudden now you're like, whoa, like I am this character and like, whoa, there's gonna be actual people out there watching us. And so I better get my act together. I better get my line down. I better get what I'm going to do because the performance was coming. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. I believe that Jesus is coming soon. Now, hey, we survived the eclipse on Monday. We're still here. Praise be to God. Like, oh, that was was a close one. I don't know when Jesus is coming. And you might even be wondering, well, why would we build when Jesus is coming back? And, and, And I understand the sentiment of the question. But I would say we shouldn't ask why should we build. We should ask why not build right now. Can you imagine, and again, please don't say that, take this as my prediction of when Jesus is coming back, okay? But could you imagine if we're sacrificing and we're giving and we're being generous and we're building this new house of the Lord to draw people in and to tell people about the gospel? Could you imagine if Jesus came back while we were doing that? That would be amazing. 
Because we wouldn't have wasted anything because we would have been doing everything we could in these last days to do all we can to reach people for Jesus. In fact, I think that Jesus, if he were to come back, would be honored by your faith and our obedience of saying to the last day we had on this earth, we were trying to reach people. Now, I've shared this with you before, but Jesus says, I've come to work the works of him that sent me while it is day, for the night comes when no man can work. And so we shared last week, we, we, we'll stop sharing the gospel when we get to heaven. That's when we stop. But until then, if we have another five years, 500 years, whatever it is on God's timetable, we need to move forward now. But let me tell you, it's dress rehearsal time. It's getting serious. You see the news. You hear of what's happening in Israel and Iran, and you, you just start to get glimpses of what is going to happen at some point in the future. And it doesn't, it shouldn't cause you to have fear. You shouldn't be walking around in fear. You shouldn't say, oh man, what's going to happen? Oh no, what, what's, what is this going to, oh no, I need to like, you know, just hide out. I need, to, I need to bunker down. No, what we should be doing in this season is, God, if you are coming back soon, what can I do now to tell more people about you? And so I want to encourage you, don't live in fear. Sure, it's unknown. Sure, it's unsettling. But God's got this. He is the king of the throne. He has the victory. He has you. He has us. Now, as we close our time together, I want to share this last thing with you. And would you take out that card with you and just hold that in your hands? There are seven things on here. Whenever you hear a message, you should always ask, well, what's the next step? And we have an easy next step for you. On this card are seven things, and you can check off as many as you like, but here's what we're going to ask you to do. We're going to ask you to do these things. Some are daily, some are weekly, but over the next 21 days or three weeks, would you commit to doing these things? This card in front of you is actually perforated, and you can actually tear it off, and you're going to keep the larger card with you. And on the smaller card, we're asking you to put your name and what you're going to commit to. Now, let me, I, I have to promise you, I, I will not show up at your door asking where you were at the prayer walk that you sign up for, okay? I, I won't do that. This isn't to us, to, for us to keep track of you. And I won't have binoculars outside my office window of like, who's doing what? Like, I won't do that. This is all because in a few weeks, what we're going to be doing uh, next month is we're going to be having this Reveal Sunday where we're going to celebrate all that God has done, and we're going to actually total up all the hours prayed. By the way, the, the walk of faith around our campus is about 0.57 miles. You can bring your kids, bring your dogs, just clean up after them, uh, bring whoever you want, and walk around the campus, and we're going to total all that up. And over the next three weeks, and we're going to share with you in a few weeks what our church has done for the glory of God. And that's what the purpose of this card is for us. But here's what I want you to do. I believe that God's calling every one of you to obey him in some area. And it might not make sense. You might think, man, I, I don't know. I've never fasted before. Uh, Amy and I, we're going to be doing a liquid fast for the next 21 days. And I know some health restrictions don't allow for that, and that's totally fine. But you could fast something. How much better would your life be if you fasted social media? All of us would be better for that. What if you fasted shopping for the next 21 days? Ooh, some of you are like, all right, I'm out of here. What if we fasted sports for the next 21 days? That's a hard one because we've got NFL draft coming up. We've got NBA playoffs <laughs> coming up. Like... I don't know about that one. That might be too far. But all of us can fast something. You know what fasting means? It means that we're giving up something good for something better. Yeah, sports are good, but my relationship with Jesus is better. Yeah, shopping is fun, but my walk with God is more important. Food is important but I'm going to spend some time, and maybe you fast breakfast. You're going to skip breakfast, or maybe you skip sugar, or whatever it is. There's some ideas there, but here's the idea for all of us is that we would be willing to fast something and say, God, I'm going to give up something good for something better. Maybe you, maybe you, you like uh, uh, Pastor Manny mentioned a moment ago, you set a timer for 1031 a.m. or p.m. Maybe you teach, and you can't have a timer going off at 1031. I understand, but maybe it's at night, or maybe you set another time. Whatever it is, all of us 
can do something, my question for you is this. What is God calling you to obey him in? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? I want, I want to give you a moment right now to pray. It's a very simple prayer, and the prayer is this. God, what boxes should I check? I don't believe that you should be praying about, God, should I even do this? No, I think that's been decided. Trust me. I think God's calling our church into an obedience that doesn't often make sense to the world, but he's going to bless in a powerful way. And so maybe you say, God, what, what can I do? Can I be involved in the prayer chain? Can I do the prayer walk? Maybe I'm going to come to a worship night, or maybe I'm going to just uh, go through this 21-day devotional that our team has prepared. What is it for you that God is calling you to obey him in? Now, there's some in this room that this is your first time, or maybe you came back to the church and it's been a while, and, or maybe you've never been in a connection or a relationship with Jesus. We're not here to shame you or guilt you in anything because the very first thing for you to do is say, Jesus, I know that I've done wrong. I believe you love me. Can you please forgive me and come into my life? And maybe for many of you, that is your next step. We've had many hands already in our services before that said, would you pray with me? Because I want to accept Jesus. And so maybe you're sitting here and that's your next step. Maybe you need to say, Pastor Jeremy, would you pray with me? Because I want to uh, allow Jesus to come into my life and change me from the inside out. How we do it here at this church is we don't ask you to stand, come forward. I won't call out your name. I just want to agree with you, with you simply lifting your hand, and I'll agree with you and I'll pray with you. In the quietness of this moment, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Is there anybody in here that would say, would you pray with me, Pastor Jeremy? I see you all the way in the back. I agree with you. I see you. I see you. I see both of you. I see you up here. I see you. What a great decision you guys are all making. Declaring, Jesus, I need, I need you. I see you up here. I see you. Thank you for your honesty, your transparency. I believe that God's going to bless you. I see you as well. I agree with you. What a great decision. I see you over here. I see you. What a great decision that you're making. I see you all the way in the back. I see both of you all the way in the back. I agree with you. What a great decision. I see you too. I see you. If you're feeling like this is what I need, like that's not me, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. I see you guys up here as well. Well, for those that raise their hand in this room, I see you all the way over here to my right or to my left. What a great decision that you're making. I see you up here as well. Thank you for your honesty. It's a bold thing to say, Jesus, I need you. So for those that raise their hand, would you pray something like this with me? Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. I know that I've done wrong. I know that I'm a sinner. But would you forgive me? Would you come into my life and clean me from the inside out and help me to walk in your ways? Thank you for loving me. And thank you for this gift of salvation. Help me to walk with you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching this message uh, from the Highlands. Our goal here at the Highlands is to become people of the Word. We love the Word of God, and the message you just heard was filled with scriptures that we pray would be an encouragement to you. Make sure that you share, if you were encouraged by this message with others, to help us get God's Word out. Uh, if you have not yet subscribed to our channel, I want to encourage you. We have messages and content every week that would encourage you and help you grow in your faith. And then make sure you uh, just like this video. And we want to continue to get the gospel out to as many people as we know how to as we're able to. This is great technology. Thank you for joining us on YouTube. We pray that you're encouraged. Pray that you have a great week and that you would live out what you just heard in your daily life.